Now we are beginning our vibrant summer. And what better way to do that than these vibrant individuals right, exactly. right here Woo! with Pastor Claire. And so um, there, Pastor Claire is going to lead us talking about the love of God as it's shown forth in fathers. And I'll hand it off. All too. right. And you can sit right down there, Don. And then as soon as Ryan Shockey comes back from dropping his tribe off, he'll be in that chair right next to you, Josh. So help him find his way. All right. No, in fact, nobody should get close to me because I'm contagious, I'm pretty sure. So anyway, everybody put up the shield of faith. That's why I did not serve you communion this morning. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, I just have to say, Fathering Day is one of those days where um, it's a mixed bag. You know, we have many situations in the room around fathers. And, um, and we're so grateful that in a world where there's a lot of um, uh, disturbance that we actually have good men who drop their children off in children's church and then come up with their coffee and sit down, you know. And, um, and so I know that uh, at Crossroads, we are in the midst of great mentors, um, coaches, leaders, uh, people who have fathered children biologically, people who father children in the kingdom of God. Um, this week I put on my Facebook page, I said, you know, we had this, this word um, mothering when we were talking about Mother's Day and we talked about the feminine imagery in scripture, uh, in scripture of describing God as mother bear, mother hen, all, all of these kinds of things. And then we can find so many great scriptures about fathers, but we know that no matter how, the great scriptures we find, people still have some challenges around these days that are really not scriptural days. They're kind of hallmark. Do you know what I'm talking about? But because we live here on planet Earth, we can find ways to celebrate with people uh, in ways that help us see the heart of God. So I wrote on my Facebook page, you know, can somebody help, help a sister out again? And there was uh, John Knox, not like the original John Knox that founded the Presbyterians, right? But John Knox, my friend John Knox, who's a pastor, um, he wrote about the fact that his father passed away and that there was a guy named Mr. Grow, I think G-R-E-A-U-X. He said that fathered him and helped form him. And he said, I know I am who I am today because this man stepped in to my life. I gotta tell you, John Knox is the chaplain um, for the Texas State Police, whatever they're called. Um, he, he goes into the hardest of the hardest situations. And I gotta tell you, that guy has a heart. He has a heart that, re that reflects the father heart of God. Sean, Sean and Scott and others know him. He is, um, and, and so it didn't come through a biological father that he developed this heart that was able to give. And so can we just say thanks be to God for good men? Good men. One of our friends, I gotta tell you, it's, it's kinda sad. Uh, one of our other friends who's a pastor, he wrote this on my page today, he said, or on his page, one of the things I've found interesting, maybe that it, a bit disturbing, is that my experience with Father's Day is quite different from Mother's Day, maybe especially around the church, because mothers are generally celebrated as the heroes of the family, and dads are typically admonished to do better, be better. And I just said, this is not okay, because we live among great men. <clears throat> and, and men, yeah. And, um, and, and so what we know is in a time that is difficult, we can highlight the great uh, father heart of God energy in our midst. So we just wanna, can we just celebrate today that the father heart of God can be seen um, in our church and, and some of these dudes and certainly all you dudes out there have the ability to, to bring it on. So I'm gonna ask um, Charles, who's the, he is the eldest elder at our church. He doesn't like that I say that, but you'll all be shocked. You know, Charles is like 102. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, and I, I'm telling you, he will outrun you, he will outwork you, he will out everything you. Uh, and so anyway, I won't get going because there's only three minutes each and your little clock will be up there and when you go in the red, there's a cane uh, and a taser. And, a, and anyway, only kidding. So let's welcome Charles Theodorovich. Great, great father heart. Oh, he's going all techie. I'd like to start with a uh, quote by Gandhi. Your beliefs become your thoughts. 
Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values. And your values become your destiny. I thought that was a great, uh, a mm -hmm. great quote. I really mm -hmm. like that. And that's something to uh, ponder, and for me at least, and to um, even at this stage of life and um, at 102, a father of mostly well adults and, and a grandfather mm -hmm. as well, uh, to remember those things. And um, I like to think that God has groomed some of that in me and, mm -hmm. and used it in my. Um, my ability to father. I was contemplating what I would share, as I, and I realized I wanted to share the most influential uh, of my core values, which guided my fatherhood. Uh, the value of my relationship with Jesus Christ is the most influential and vital guide for me as a father. And um, the way I came to that is um, I remember my mother being a strong woman of faith in God. This is a little different twist because um, I never really had a relationship with my father. He was in the house, but um, there wasn't any relationship there. And, but my mother, um, during my childhood and beyond, she was always a strong support and a great encourager to me. Um, she displayed compassion, peace, love, and positivity to her children. Now, you have to understand that we had a family of eight children. My father was pretty much doing his own thing. And my mother went through some seriously difficult experiences as a mother and as a wife. But all along, she exhibited those attributes and many more. She was one who maybe didn't read Bible stories to us or say a whole lot about scripture. Um, but th her demeanor, the way that she lived her life, the way that she related to her children with love and tenderness and compassion um, seemed to, I, I would say, seemed to seep or penetrate. And at least for me, I, I can't speak for my siblings, but um, it was able to, um, I think, put into me what I needed to be as a father, mm -hmm. as strange as that may sound. Mm -mm. Um, so I believe it was, uh, it was her loving uh, influence in my life which led me to know Jesus. And I believe uh, he has guided me in every step of my life. I've, many times I've taken an inventory because, trust me, I haven't always been a, a good individual. I dropped the ball many, many times. And, the good thing is that I've gotten up again. Mm -hmm. um, but as I look back, I can see all the areas in my life that maybe not even knowing and realizing, but I could see where God was involved in, in many of those situations that sometimes I regret now, and, but I know that God forgives me. And as Pastor was speaking in the first service, um, I'm going give to give away your secret. Is that okay? No. Okay. Because he's still coming back. He's going to be a surprise know, guest I, at the end. That's why I asked permission. <laughs> but what I think uh, my mother did for me is that um, she really was responsible for me being the father that I really could be hmm. in, in God's eyes. So. Yeah, and so you're living that scripture where the, the faith of your grandmother and your mother, you know, T Timothy, it was actually his grandmother and mother that raised him to know Jesus and become the kind of father heart. And you guys, thank Charles for being the father heart of God in our house, for people in our house. Amen. Amen. So right next to you, Josh Roby, would you like to follow up and let us know the core value that's guiding your father heart? Yeah, well, let me say it's hard to follow Charles. And, um, you know, as I, I sat up here, I was just looking around this, this row of guys and um, one of the things that um, I appreciate so much is that uh, every one of the people up here are somebody I look up to in their example, right? Mm. And, um, but as I was thinking about you know, what is the core value that um, really kind of resonates with me, so much of it is um, uh, creating an environment where our, our children realize that, um, that uh, life is bigger than them, right? That, um, 
you know, we, we want them to be outward focused. We want them to love people and uh, really to live their life in a way where um, it's, it's bigger than them. And, and so, you know, what, that's something that's really kind of drove a lot of what we do and, and um, how, we, um, yeah, how we live our life and, and uh, how we raise our kids is that, you know, um, when, when a, somebody years ago made a statement that just has always resonated with me that the only truly appreciating asset in life is investing in people. And, you know, everything else, you know, the Bible tells us that, you know, we're to store up our treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy, right? And, um, and so, you know, as, as we live our life with our kids and, and father our, our kids, we want them to see that example in our life too. And that um, it's just outward focused. And, and so, you know, even in our home, um, one thing that's a real value to us is um, our kids just seeing us living that way. Mm. That, um, you know, it, it's, I was thinking about this earlier today that, you know, um, our legacy is not our children. Mm. Our legacy is much larger than our children. Now, our children are a very, very important part of our legacy, and, and we integrate them into that. Um, but we don't want to put this pressure on our kids that uh, we're living our life <coughs> through them. You know, one of the things that I see a lot in our culture today is that you know, kids are, um, are under so much pressure, I think a lot of times from fathers, because their fathers are trying to live their life vicariously through their kids in sports and things like that. And I don't think that's fair to kids, you know. I think that what, what kids need to see is a father and a mother that are still in pursuit of, of God's dream for their life. Mm -hmm. And that they're living their life every day with purpose. And, and I, I think that just creates a different environment for, for kids to grow up in where they, they see a dad, a mom um, in, pursuit of, mm -hmm. in pursuit of God as, as what you know, Charles was talking about, but in, in pursuit of um, living out their God-given dream and potential, mm -hmm. and, and sowing into other people, and you know what that looks like. It's a lot of little practical things. You know, we've taught our kids that when you know, someone comes to our home, and uh, you know, we we let them know when there's people coming over, and those people are important. And as soon as they walk in the door, our, our kids run up and give them hugs and welcome them, even if they're somebody they don't know. And I, I realize that's strange for some folks and stuff like that, but we just want them to be living a life that's outward focused. Yeah, Josh, that is so awesome. And we have seen that in you. Um, I can't count how many people I've met that you led to Jesus Christ. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's been a regular rhythm in the years that you've been in church that you've brought people here and they sit right next to you and you say, this person just gave their life to Jesus on Friday. This person just gave their life to Jesus in our business meeting. And I, I wanna say that kingdom mentality is the father heart of God and so thank you. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right, and so Ryan Shockey, to, um, welcome, to the, welcome to the platform and, um, and tell us about your core value. Yeah, so this is a tough question to ask somebody over text message. I know. <laughs> we get this random text message. What is the core value that leads you through <laughs> fatherhood? And Aren't you glad I don't have your phone number? You never and, know what I'm going to ask. And I'll be honest with you. I was in two days of a, a two-day-long meeting. This is kind of the last thing on my mind trying to figure this out. And Because core value, I feel like, sets you up, almost sets you up for failure mm. because that's your core value. Right? What are you teaching your children that you don't ever want them to give up? Um, for me in my life and with my children, having three girls, I feel very blessed and I feel a, a special uh, job that I have with, with raising young women. Um, my core value for them is love. Um, no matter what happens in their lives, whatever happens in, in my life and Catherine's life, I want them to love and, and to know that, that that's always true and that's always there for them. Um, we talk a lot about our fathers. Um, we can all admit that there's no perfect father, but at the end of the day, every time I call my father and, and talk to him, he loves me, and, and I know that. And I know that that overrides a lot of the imperfections. And to um, create an environment for my daughters where that's the expectation, and I, I'm sorry, guys, in the future, they're gonna have a really high expectation for you <laughs> because <laughs> I, try to, I try to show that to them every day in the way I treat their mother and the, and the way I love them and what that, that uh, relationship should be like and look like and feel like. And um, so love, I think, is where it all, it all comes from with the core value. And then to add to that, I know you only said one, 
but um, <laughs> being Sorry, you have another minute and 15. <laughs> oh, um, being intentional, mm. right? Everything they do should have intention to it. Um, thinking about their actions, thinking about that love and knowing why and why they're doing that. So those are my two that I really try to hold true to. Again, a core value is, is something to put that emphasis on, right? And I don't think there could be a better one for me than love with the three beautiful girls I have. Yeah, and for your three girls, but also as the athletic director of Olivet College, right? So you got, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. So you got a ton of kids looking to you. A yeah, ton we have, of kids. We yeah. We have 600 students in the athletic department that we love on every day and, and show them what that is. Um, forgiveness comes with love. Second opportunities comes with love. Excitement comes with love. Um, so it's really everywhere with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and I wonder, you know, even when you say you could call your dad and he's always going to love you, that's not the story for everybody. But because you are the embodiment of that, there's 600 kids at Olivet College that can benefit from that presence. And so we just thank God for you, Ryan. Thank yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> Father Hart, David. David Gamble, tell us about your core value. So David's an overachiever, and uh, you got to watch out when you're hanging out with people like him. He sent me an entire like set of core values when I asked him about the one core value. So, uh, Dr. Gamble, would you um, go ahead and bring it on? Uh, well, really, is I'm not an overachiever. Um, <laughs> I've just been on this journey and pursuit um, for 18 years now. So when you asked me this question, it was 18 years of work. And the reason I say 18 years of work, my father passed in 2001. Uh, and like most sons, I uh, used the old cliche, if I could just be half the man, father, husband, uh, as my father, then I would be doing pretty good. Uh, but in reality, um, even growing up in a household with a uh, strong, godly father, um, I didn't really know how to execute that. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I sent you <laughs> was my pursuit of figuring mm -hmm. out what that meant. Pursuit. Uh, because uh, my father passed, my oldest was three and a half. So I figured I at least had a few more years to have him help me figure out how to be a, a godly father and to come up with my core value. So essentially, I just have one core value, but uh, in my pursuit of it, I uh, discovered um, um, 10 principles to help me adhere to that core value. Um, I won't give all 10, because <laughs> I don't have that long, but I will name them, and then I will talk about the principle um, that um, currently um, in the season of my life is uh, ringing loud for me. So my core value, the one core value is to be a strong, godly Christian father, modeling and leading my family in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, the 10 principles uh, that help me ad uh, adhere to that, the first one is uh, pursue holiness. The second one is to know what you can control and can't control. The third one, uh, provide in every realm. Um, the, the fourth one is practice humility. Mm -hmm. The fifth one is persist in joy and thanksgiving. The sixth one is uh, be effusive in your love. Seventh, live in grace. Eighth, protect and be strong. Nine, godly uh, glory in my weakness uh, and live with God's glory in view is the last mm. one. Oh. The one that uh, is resound pretty loudly for me at this season in my life is the second one, is to know what you can control and what you can't control. Can we just repeat that? Know what you can control and what you can't control, yeah. And as a father, I just uh, <laughs> feel like this is very important because when you're leading your family in Christ and uh, your children in particular, um, you can encourage, uh, exalt them, teach them, your children in faith, but you cannot control their embrace or growing in that faith. Um, that is 
are for God and for them. Uh, therefore, I say, um, don't neglect what you have responsibility for. And as a father, and my wittiness, and sometimes my wife had to remind me some of my comments, uh, especially towards my oldest. Uh, fathers have to uh, understand that they serve their family well when they're seeking to control their own anger, selfishness, pride, mm. and tongue. Um, and when I talk about this season in my life, um, when you're um, encouraging and training and teaching your children in faith as a father, and as my father did, um, we wanted to make sure that our children embrace those things for themselves. Mm -hmm. So two years, well, this coming up September will be two years, and I always say it's my most uh, important uh, success story or accomplishment is when my oldest offered herself a baptism. Uh, I always say September is my favorite <coughs> month. My oldest seems to think it's because I was born in September. Mm. And then she goes to the second. Uh, my mother was born in September. Um, but I have to remind her um, when I'm trying to live into the principle number two that it was because uh, the result of that is my oldest giving herself or offering herself a baptism, and she was baptized in September uh, two years ago. That is awesome, 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 awesome. Yeah, and, um, and so maybe at the men's barbecue in July, you can preach on all 10 of those points and give worksheets to everybody. That'd be really cool too, right? Yeah, so um, Ryan, hi Ryan. Yeah, I think you might have the most kids in the church. <laughs> is that true? This is a true story. It is. And so, Ryan, we would love to hear the core value that makes you a father of? Ten. Ten. Ten kids. How uh, do you take caffeine pills? I mean, what, what are, what's your core value? Maybe sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I could use one right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to summarize, you know, what, a, what the core value would be, but... Right now, there's just a theme within our family. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm suffering from what you're suffering from. <laughs> but uh, a theme within our family of living a life of significance. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, where we found ourselves within our first few kids is just caught up in, you know, what we were, what we were uh, shown the example of, like just um, kind of living a standard life. Um, you know, we got, we uh, were uh, susceptible to what society uh, society's expectations of a uh, of parenting were, and you know how many kids was too many kids, and when the right time to have kids is, and you know what the education of the kids should look like, um, you know uh, just just a, a lot of uh, outside influence on on us was causing us to make our decisions a certain way, and then um, about our third or fourth uh, child in between there. Um, we really recognize that we don't, that we just need to give it up to God in, in, mm. um, in, in so many different aspects of our life and, and, uh, and really look at what's best for our family and not, not base that on what was taught of us um, either by our parents or by culture, okay? Mm. And so coming out of that, we really just um, recognize that God has created everybody with a purpose, you know, and he's given everybody a different dream. Um, something that they're supposed to live their life out that's very significant. And, um, and we don't see that in a lot of other families, you know, and, but we want our family to, to really, uh, I don't know, uh, we want to emphasize that. And so what we, what we really try to do is focus on the strengths that we recognize that God has given our kids, um, the, the specific passions that they have, we believe we're given by Him. Um, and so um, in all of our decision making, we try to uh, if, if, there's, if there's a decision that could go one way or another, just really um, making sure that it's in line with their God-given passions mm. and, and God-given abilities, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, it's just a beautiful thing. I mean, a lot of people look at, uh, you know, think about a family with 10 kids and they think, oh, they, they all probably dress the same. They all walk as little ducklings, you know, behind, behind the parents. <laughs> that you know. would be helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of stereotypes of what a family of 10 looks like, and they feel like they're all identical, you know. But, mm -hmm. but when, I, when I look at my family, um, because of the way we've, we've have raised them so far, I just recognize that, you know, I see, like, everyone is a very unique individual and um, show, uh, exhibiting the strengths that, that God has given them, you know. 
Wow, Ryan, I love the tears behind your eyes while you're thinking about that. That's just, that is really significant. And the uniqueness of your family is a gift um, at, to our congregation. And so is the uniqueness of every family, right? And so this mission that God's given you with 10 children um, that you love and are training up in the way they should go, you know, can you imagine? I mean, Jesus had 11 that stayed with him, and look what happened through that. So anyway, we say thank you for showing us the Father heart of God. Jacques Short. Hello, I'm Jacques Short. And me and my wife have a lot of kids out there that we embrace and mentor. Um, I've never met anybody with so many godchildren. I swear. <laughs> I, I almost thought you were it's Italian <laughs> for a minute because everybody, all these kids, I meet them. They say, "Yeah, it's my godmother. It's my god." I'm like, seriously. Yeah, we, yeah. And we've been loving it. But I'm blessed, and I just want to let my four biological boys who are with us today in the congregation um, just want to let them know that I am very proud and honored to be your father, and I think you are four awesome guys, and I love you. It's mm, awesome. Um, and my wife, um, she Don't has been. Don't get started, Jacques. She's been a key point. <laughs> <laughs> my wife. It's see? your wife. I heard it. I heard it. <laughs> she's been a key point in helping me. Um, develop into a core value simply mm. because 27 years ago when my oldest was born I had no idea I w what to do you know that was new to me um, I missed the the classes on being a father nobody gave me the book you know he came into the world and they just said here you go you know and that's how I felt mm. so my method in my mind was totally wrong because I had nothing to use as an example or model for raising a young man. Um, so my fathering core value started 27 years ago when I got to the point after um, being spanked on the hand many times by my wife, no, we will <laughs> not do it this way. Um, you need to pray and think of other ways to do this. It's not working. And so I said, you know what? Okay, Lord, me and you, let's get together. And my core value for fathering can be um, is a personal declaration that I've been living with for 27 years, and it can be summed up in is some it is summed up in a sentence, and it's basically um, following the lead of the Spirit of God mm -hmm. in fathering by example. Um, should I say following the uh, lead of the Spirit of God through intentionally father, fathering by example through the words that I say and through the things that I do. So I kind of mumbled that up. So I'm going to say it again just so you can hear the intentionality of the words that I'm saying. Fathering um, by the lead of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, fathering intentionally fathering by example through the words that I say and the things that I do. Um, everything that I did when they asked me to, um, <laughs> when they, whatever they asked me, whether it's to go hang out with friends, what friends they could hang out and what friends they couldn't, <laughs> um, it was led by the Spirit of God mm. in prayer. You know, and my older two used to joke all the time because when I kind of discerned that they weren't telling the truth, they used to think me and God was like, no joke. I was the only one that could hear from God because I'll tell them if I thought they was lying, I'd say, I'm going to ask God and see what he says. So you got a little time to tell me the truth. So they used to tell their little brothers, you better tell him the truth because he's going to ask God and he's going to tell him. That's awesome. That went on forever. Everybody take that home to your, parent, your parenting. Yeah. So basically that's um, what my core value is summarized mm, in that one sentence there. Thank you. And we've seen that, Jacques. You are a person led by the Spirit and, um, and, and really grateful that even you naming, um, and you did a little more earlier, just that even in your mistakes, letting the Spirit then convict you to move back in another direction. 
So being led by the Spirit doesn't mean you're going to do it right. Uh, when you say you're committing to that intentionally, right. doesn't mean you're not going to make a mistake. Right. But if you're saying you're intentionally being led by the Spirit, you'll also be called to repentance easily yes. too, yeah. which is just awesome. Say that in the microphone. A lot of repentance. Yeah. Meaning, and yeah. mind you, repentance not just to God, but repentance to those who I potentially harmed. So, you know, being yeah. humble. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sean Patrick. Yeah. Well, Jacques, I, I need to use that trick and polygraph. I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go talk to the spirit and I'll be uh, back. The Lord's going to tell me if you're telling the truth or not. So. Anyway, thanks. It's an honor to be up here um, with these men of valor, for sure, and uh, my beautiful sister-in-law as well, and all of you guys that are here. Uh, my core value uh, really is who I am. It's love, like uh, Ryan said. You know, I got married, Kathleen and I got married very young, and, uh, you know, my motivation for uh, her was truly love. And, you know, as a young man, you know, in that period of time in my life, uh, you know, it, it, it can be a very selfish time for a young man. Um, so when Kathleen had uh, gotten pregnant and Kathleen and I got married, I knew immediately that I had to be responsible. And that motivation was love for her, which began to spread into every part and aspect of our life. And everything I did, I tried to do out of love. I tried to be motivated and, and, and uh, whether it was playing college football and working, going to school, and I used that, uh, always passing it through the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit, like Jacques mentioned. You know, I knew I couldn't be that person I needed to be without God. And I knew I couldn't be that person I needed to be without my wife and without my family. And there, there is a process in love and it's accountability to the process. And I think the motivation in my life, the core value that I gave to my girls and to my son and uh, to my son-in-laws and the people that I have influence over is you can be a man of steel and love very delicately and very lovingly. And uh, you can be more powerful in the midst of uh, that time where you need that power when you, when you walk in love. Mm -hmm. and, and I think my children, I believe my children and my grandchildren have received that from Kathleen and I both. Uh, my father and my mother were always loving us, um, you know, and I saw that in, in both of them. I saw it in my brothers, I saw it in my sister. So, you know, I, I just knew that, you know, God had called me to a purpose of love. And it, that, that is the motivation in my heart for my family. And the things that have come from that, that the fruit of that, have, have blessed me. It has blessed me. I am a, a very wealthy man. I am a very rich man, and it's because God has blessed me. He first loved me that I could love, and that is the core value of my life. Mm. I am a two in the personality styles. And which, I is truly, the, which is the helper, the lover, the caregiver yeah, for people who don't know it, what a two it, it is. It just yeah. is who I am, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying I'm perfect by any means. In the midst of that love, there was a lot of error, a lot of mistakes, a lot of selfishness. So that would be uh, something that I could honestly say um, was truly my motivation, is to love. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm blessed by God that as much love as I feel I've given out, I have received much more. Beautiful. For sure. Beautiful. No doubt my, my life. If we had a chief loving officer at Crossroads Church, <laughs> It would be Sean. And what you may or may not know is Sean was the first person that we sent to Haiti um, when there were things that did not exist in Haiti. Um, we sent the chief loving officer to Haiti and his, his love touched that country and has um, touched this church and made us a church uh, be what it is because of 
many of those loving, powerful moments. So we thank you and we love you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah, Amen. I, I just want to say that. No, nope, you're done. Over oh, time, over okay. time. <laughs> you mentioned Haiti. I, just wanted, I know. I'm like, okay. I just wanted to say that uh, Pastor Carlo sent me a card today and uh, he says that he loves us and oh. uh, he loves Pastor Scott and the gift of a father that he is. So mm. just wanted to say that. Beautiful. Well, Carlo, I felt like I Awesome. Knew. Happy Father's Day, Pastor Carlo. Yes. Pastor Carlo has no biological children. He has thousands of spiritual children in Haiti and we thank God for him. And Don, yes, Don, tell us that core value that guides that capo regime. So one of the main ones, and the one we'll talk about today, is uh, modeling equality and equity in the home. And uh, from, from day one, Rhonda and I decided that our marriage and our family was going to be a partnership. And so we've really tried to live by that. Um, any illusion of control I might have had disappeared on February 10th, 1996, when our <laughs> oldest was born. And then Sarah came, and then we went from man to man to zone defense, defense with Noah in 99. And then our youngest was born in 2001, and she just graduated from high school. So we are still figuring it out because uh, they've all graduated, and now two are coming back with their dogs, so help us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's six adults and four dogs at our house today. <laughs> so, um, but what we really wanted to model to them from the beginning was that uh, to recognize their individual gifts and purpose, uh, not by gender, but who they were created to be. How they played and things they wanted to do were encouraged uh, and based on who they were, not whether they were a boy or a girl. Now, this wasn't always perfect. I didn't always model it perfectly. And the kids found their way to not always do it perfectly as well. Uh, Sarah, when they were young, wanted to prove her toughness. And so Noah developed this thing called the boy test. And the boy test was uh, he made her walk through mud and climb up on things. The very final thing that would help her achieve whatever it was they were going to get and thankfully, Rhonda was looking out the window at the moment this was happening was, she was supposed to grab the dog doo-doo with her bare hands and walk it across the yard to the front door. <laughs> thankfully, my wife is very wise, and it must have been the Holy Spirit that told her to stop it, and she did. So, so, uh, so the boy test wasn't completed, but it's very clear that these young women are every bit as uh, tenacious as the son mm -hmm. in our house. And, um, and so we try to teach each of them that girls and women are worthy of respect, regardless of whether they're their mothers, sisters, or grandmothers, but because they were wonderfully created by God in the same but wonderfully diverse way that boys and men were, boys and men were. And if we, when we started with that, and if we all can begin like that, um, we can understand that discussions about toxic masculinity shouldn't cause men to react and be upset and feel like we're all being attacked because toxic masculinity is the part that says I deserve power because I'm physically larger and stronger. I should be able to touch or treat any woman that I want to because it's my birthright. It's fine for me to dominate women in school or in the workplace and take things that I want because it has always been that way. And anytime you hear the phrase, it's always been that way, mm. you better know you should change that thing. Mm. And so we need to show and teach little boys that, uh, and little girls that when you're aggressive with others on the playground, it's not because, oh, he must just like you. And men shouldn't be afraid of these conversations because it, be, it gives us the opportunity to act like Christ to be the partaker of the divine nature that welcomed women into mm. the fold, gave positions of leadership and prominence to them. That listen, and, um, and so we need to not be afraid, but be willing to have these conversations. And look, there's give and take that happens in it. There is intensity in our house between each person taking different views, but we can have these conversations and say, this will not go on in my life. And we shouldn't subscribe to the lie of scarcity that says there isn't room for us all to be treated with dignity and fairness and respect. And this is That's clap worthy. That's clap worthy. So, and this begins right. in our home and it begins when we allow ourselves to parent without fear. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Don. <clears throat> Thank you. And 
you know, I, 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 this conversation actually came out of a creative team meeting because we were sitting there and we talked about, you know, were we going to do donuts for dudes again this year? But none of the dudes ate the donuts, so I'm, we're kind of thinking you're all on a health kick. So you're not getting donuts this year. Um, but what happened was, it actually first began with the women. We said, we want to highlight awesome men because all we see on social media, all we see in the headlines are the, are the dudes that are getting press for being bad dudes. And we want these, this kind of bad daddery to be seen and highlighted, like good, you know, when you're saying bad, it's bad. Like good, bad, it's bad <laughs> daddery. I think that's my own word, look it up, I'm pretty sure, but quote me on it, because I might write a book about bad daddery. Because we have seen the best of the best men in our house this house, Crossroads Church. I'm just going to tell you, we have. And so I want to say that there are dads like Pastor Carlo that haven't had biological children. There are people like many of us here whose dads have passed away. There are people here that have stories of dads that were not helpful. And we wanted to say, we want to lift up the guys in our church that are just fabulous guys. So I want to give a shout out to the men who relentlessly give their best. Can you give a shout out? Yeah. I want to have a head bowed for the men who are fathering with graciousness and strength. I want to look everywhere at men who encourage and exhort and uphold and empower other people. Can we just look for them? Just look. Look everywhere. They're here. Observe the guys who rise early, make breakfast, drive carpools, work long hours, volunteer, coach, mentor, lead, and care. Can we observe them and just begin to let the truth of that overtake the bad news? See our brothers who love their sisters, love their neighbors, children, and community with the Father heart of God. Never forget the ones that use their power for good. Use their power for good. We're even afraid to use the word power. I th I'm so sad that our brothers feel like they can't use the word power because your power is for good right, right. when you use your power in God's way. Hold on, let me cough and drink. <clears throat> I want to stand at attention for the brave and tender guys who have our backs. I want to celebrate the good fathering in our midst. That's changing generations. I want to let good men, great men, make the headlines today. Because of great men, we have hope for a future. The world is not going to hell in a handbasket, friends. There are good men. There is a small contingency that needs to get their act together. And the rest of the guys are trying every day and bringing their best selves. And so with that, I want to invite the father of this congregation. There are many fathers in this congregation, but this is the guy who um, <clears throat> eats, breathes, drinks, sleeps, crossroads, and what it means to bring the kingdom of God to you. You don't know the nights he cries over the church, you don't know the nights he stays up and prays and paces and gets up and names your name before our Heavenly Father. He takes it seriously that you are God's beloved. And I got to tell you, he does have camel knees. You should see his knees. They're, his legs are great, but his knees have <laughs> been affected by the years on them. I say to, I say to you um, that this person who has a baton in his hand um, has been given something by God to pass on to generations that will live far beyond him. And so, yours should be the last core value. Mm. Well, can we hear it for these guys? What, a, what an amazing group. Thank you, guys. And, uh, and all, of the, all of the dads, um, we've all received so much. Um, I do have a baton. Uh, when I, when I uh, gave my life to Christ early on, uh, we had our first child, Sarah. Uh, I was 20, and uh, I, as Jacques and the rest of us, I didn't go to that class. On, I, didn't, I had not even, I couldn't remember even holding a baby at that point. But I was really drawn uh, to begin to learn uh, a lot of different things, but one of the things is how can I be 
the kind of man that God wants me to be, the kind of dad, the kind of father, the kind of father in the kingdom of God. Um, and I was drawn to this scripture in Proverbs 13, 22, and it is a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. The scripture talks a lot uh, about uh, kind of transgenerational thinking when uh, the Old Testament, a lot of terminology is used. For instance, you see God speak about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, you see it uh, happen where talk, when it talks about curses and blessings that they last for three generations. So there's this thing, and then in Proverbs, of course, there's this powerful scripture about not only is a good person supposed to leave an inheritance, live in an inheritance, and then leave an inheritance for their children, but also for their children's children, which is not only our biological children, which I appreciate it's been said, but uh, is much bigger than that, but certainly includes that. So um, Jesus in John 17 uh, begins to clarify this. Uh, I, I have this baton, it sits on my desk. It's, a, it's just, uh, I actually had it made, I made it myself and I leave it on my desk and it speaks to this principle about being a father. Um, and it reminds me that there's kind of three aspects to this, like a running a track relay race when you get a baton, uh, first you receive it. So we receive, uh, I, I'm recognized as a man, as a dad, as a father in God's kingdom that I have received. And there are many that have gone before me, uh, and especially I've received from God. Every good thing in me, I've received from somebody else or I've received from God. Every good thing. And I have a wealth in me because of what has been poured into me. And I continue. Today, I've received more. Right? So I receive the baton, and there comes the responsibility with the baton. And then there is this place where, you know, in a race, if you're familiar with track relay races, is when you get the baton, you do not want to be that person on your team that begins to lag behind. You want to preserve if you're in the lead. You at least want to preserve that lead, but most ideally you build on that lead. So I want to live the kind of life where there's a velocity to my faith, to my being a man, to my, my morality, the way I live in my character, uh, the way that I proclaim Christ, the way I treat other people and love my wife and my children, my grandchildren, love everyone else, that there is not only a preserving and a building. And Jesus put it this way. Jesus said, the Father has basically placed me here on earth in John 17. Uh, he's given me all of this. And then he says, I have these people, speaking about the disciples and others, and he said, I essentially have built into them. And then he gets to the third place of the baton where he says, and now I will leave and I'm going to pass this on that, yeah, onto the future, which is the whole picture of, I realize when I look at this and I think about it, that there is, my life is finite and so is yours on earth, and I will be passing this baton. So I'm, I'm to receive, preserve and build, and then pass this baton onto the future. That my life really is to be invested. See, when you read this scripture that a good man uh, leaves an inheritance for his children's children, most of us think that that just means money. But money is only one small part of an inheritance in this context. This context and scriptural context is about wealth. It's not about riches. Riches are what you own. We all have riches, a certain level of riches. But this scripture is talking about wealth. Wealth is who you are. Wealth is a composite of everything that God and people and, and prophetic words have been poured into your life. And it is my responsibility to leave an inheritance of wealth the way that I live my life, the way that character is, is lived in me, the way that I live honestly and how I live morality and my sexuality and all of those things, uh, my faith in God, the way I worship God, the way that I pray for other people and for my family. When I hit the ground in the morning, I think, God, thank you for this responsibility and I want to be a good man. And a good man will leave an inheritance to his children's children, which would include all of us. Good men pass on the amazing wealth they've been entrusted with. And one day, all of us will pass this on to the next generation. We've already started to do that.
but you will one day pass this on. Ultimately, Jesus will finish the race for, the, for, for all of us, but it's ours to take and to hand off, to pass on wealth. So why don't we stand? And if we could, if you see one of the guys around you, if you could just kind of reach out toward them or put your hand on their shoulder. I just want to speak a blessing uh, over the men and then all of us. So on this day, I bless you with the Father's blessing. I bless you with the Father's courage, the Father's strength, wisdom. I bless you with the Father's integrity. I bless you with the Father's love. I bless you with the Father's joy. And I send you out to gather wealth and to share it, pass it on. Bless every man in this place, God. Father, I speak a blessing over every person. We're all affected by fathers. I pray that the wealth, even in the midst of difficulty at times, that we would be able to find the treasure in dark places that the wealth we've all been entrusted with would increase, that we'd all be the kind of people, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. Let it be so in all of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go and be God's representation on earth. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. Happy Father's Day, guys. Thank you.